morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Eliana La Ferrara. I'm one of the program chairs of this World Congress. And today I will be chairing this session on what can economics do for racial, uh, to, for racial justice. So uh, recent events have brought the issue of racial injustice at the forefront of the political debate. And while the events may be recent, this is just the tip of the iceberg for a problem that has very deep roots. As econometric society, we felt it was important to take the opportunity of the World Congress to have a discussion on how, as economists, we can contribute to the goal of el eliminating racial inequality. And today we have four distinguished speakers who have accepted to contribute to this panel. Kerwin Charles, who is the Indra Nuidin and Frederick Wolf Professor of Economics, Policy and Management at the Yale School of Management. And Kerwin has done extensive research on race and discrimination, as well as on inequality and intergenerational mobility. We have Lisa Cook, Professor of Economics and International Relations at Michigan State University. And Lisa does research in macro and finance, and she's done really fascinating work on lynchings as racial and racial disparities in the US. Imran Razul is also joining us, professor of economics at University College London and managing editor of the Journal of the European Economic Association. So Imran's research is broadly in applied micro, including labor development and public, and he has done research on migration and race himself but as you will see, his talk will bring the perspective of his editorial experience. And finally, we have Leonard Wanchkun, a professor of politics and international affairs at Princeton University. Leonard's research is in political economy and development, in particular on ethnicity, clientelism, de democratization. And Leonard is the founder and president of the African School of Economics, which opened in Benin in 2014. And as you will see, Leonard will bring this African perspective to the debate. So when we planned the format of the session with the speakers, we agreed that it would have two angles. The first on economics as a discipline, asking, is the research currently done in economics helpful to reduce racial inequalities in our societies? And if not, why? The second angle is on economics as a profession, asking whether we have enough diversity in our faculties, in methodological approaches and so on. And it makes sense to touch on both angles as they are likely to be interconnected. So finally, while I expect a lot of discussion on where we stand and how we got here, I would be grateful to the panelists and to you in the audience if we could also discuss ways to improve, including practical suggestions. So the way the session will be organized is that we were, are going to have the speakers uh, contribute ideas for about 10 minutes each. And then at the end, we're going to have a Q&A session where all of you are encouraged to submit questions. And you can do so by clicking the button that you find on the right hand side of your screen uh, that says ask a question. So please do that and uh, we'll try to make this as interactive, uh, interactive as possible. So having said this, um, it's my pleasure to leave the floor to Kerwin. Uh, Kerwin, please go ahead. Thank you. Eliana, thank you so much for the introduction and thanks to you and the panel for introducing me, for having me participate in this panel. I wanna make a few comments. I won't be using slides uh, and my comments will touch on the three areas in which racial equity uh, might be sought. One, I'm going to describe as access or presence in our profession, reducing racial disparities there. Second, I'll touch briefly on research success. So conditional on being in economics, uh, what can the people listening on the Zoom call contribute to, to helping achieve that success? And then finally, what, if anything, can we as practicing economists do to alter and affect, hopefully in a positive way, policy related to racial inequality? As I speak, I'm going, I'm fully cognizant, of course, of the fact that those of you on the call 
are uh, individually teachers, scholars, colleagues. And so my comments about what we might do collectively to affect the disparities and inequities that so perturb us and unnerve us uh, recognizes the capacity in which the people on the call operate professionally. Let me deal first with the issue of access. How might we achieve greater, greater racial uh, diversity in the practice of economics? And what is our role, those on the call, in helping to achieve that? It seems to me that we have two problems in this arena. We have the intake problem, that in my view, too few people of color with talent enter the profession or seek to enter it in the first instance. What can the persons on the call do to affect that intake? Here, it seems to me, our role as teacher and mentor is especially salient. So one is teaching a class on micro or labor or whatever. It seems to me that one of our obligations as a professor, as an instructor, is to identify persons with talent able to pursue graduate training in our field. The identification problem, if I may use that expression in this kind of metrics audience, is an important one for us spotting talent. Second, we must inspire said talent. And the inspiration comes in part from how and what we teach. What examples do we cite? The example that we cite can have the effect of inducing someone who would not have otherwise considered our field as something in which to spend her career to take it up. I remember my own training and how the examples chosen by my instructors made me convinced that this thing called economics was one heck of an interesting thing with relevance to me and the questions that interested me. We must be thoughtful, deliberate in this way, in the examples we pick, how we deliver thus and so. Then there is the matter of persuasion, having identified, having inspired a talented student, a talented African-American or a talented Latina will have options. She could go to business school. She could do other things. She could go to law school. And so one way to induce her to consider our profession is to get to know her, talk to her, engage in active persuasion. This is all the more important because the relatively low representation of persons of color in our field means that she will not be otherwise receiving that encouragement and that persuasion. That must be done by people on this call if we wish to alter the intake. What about the outtake? That's only one people coming in is only one part of the thing. I think back over my career and I, about leaving. <laughs> people who try to enter the profession, entering a PhD program say, and then leaving. Like, what is that about? Each of us has had the experience where someone, the, the roadblock is, I don't know, the macro prelim, okay? Or, or, or the roadblock is the second half of the metrics prelim. And we know this person. We've taught them in the first year and we can spot the talent. Now I'm talking about a PhD student. They've been through our core. We've taught them. We've talked to them in the hall and we can see the talent. Yeah. And yet I myself have had to do it. We ultimately have to go to tell her after she can't get over. She can't get over the met design pro pro aspect of her micro prelim. You got to go. We have to say. Do we have to say? Do we have to say? I don't know that we have to say. I think we want to be thoughtful about this. That if we observe that we're losing people because of the barriers we erect to passing beyond the first and second year, it is incumbent upon us to re-examine those barriers. Notice, I am not hard arguing here for a whole scale irresponsible relaxation of standards. I am sort of constitutionally opposed to that. But I am saying that it behooves us to think hard about both intake and exit that we affect in terms of how we govern our PhD training. There are other ideas one might have about presence and representation, but I move on to my second thing in the interest of time. So someone is now an economist. He has made it through the hurdles. He's been identified and inspired. He got through his prelims, yeah? Someone identified him while he was writing and helped him craft his dissertation. This is a very important part of the training. But now we send him off into the world and he is an academic economist. 
He's an African American, African, so let's say, academic economy. What can the people on the call do to affect his professional success? My second thought. Increasingly, it seems to me, and this is especially true in empirical economics, the slice of the world that I know best, success requires increasingly access to secure data, yeah? Connections to data granting authority. Engagement with teams of senior researchers scattered around the country and internationally. Presence in clubs of various sorts. I don't use the word club here pejoratively at all. I have in mind not aggregations of distinction like say the Econometric Society, I do not mean that. I mean instead that a young scholar plying her trade somewhere in the United, you know, in her first or second year, needs to get her work seen, needs to understand what people in the area are working on, needs to know what editors believe to be interesting, needs to know why this thing is a dead end and a settled matter, thus and so. In the absence of connections, if I may use that word, she has no way of gathering this information. The people on the call can affect, can affect her presence in things like the NBER. Yes? Isa, bread, you get my point. That these clubs matter and they matter disproportionately for faculty of color to the extent that historically unrepresented groups have no means no ready mechanism for acquiring that accent. Positive steps must be taken by persons like those on the call, yeah? To address this kind of exclusion. It's not a willful deliberate exclusion, but it matters for professional success. Clubs, data, connection to teams, yeah? There's also this, that many of the questions that interest this young scholar, about which she has vague, notions. Let's take the idea of systemic racism, an idea au courant in American society today, uh, talked about by scholars of different types, not only economists. And she has that kind of notion in her head as well. She wants to get involved. The people on the call can help lay the intellectual theoretical underpinnings that help her determine what predictions are testable. All of us have a responsibility here as a field to define to clarify, to describe equilibrium constructs, and to, for example, produce testable predictions and implications that can be taken to data. That's our responsibility. I close with this in my last minute. What can we do with respect to policy? We can do a lot, okay? We can do a lot. Uh, I hear the term statistical discrimination bandied about by non-economists. It's used irresponsibly and inaccurately. We can weigh in on that. The persons on the call can weigh in on that. Let me write an op-ed, one of you might say, clarifying how the term is used, yes? Somebody has written a paper about unemployment insurance and, and you know unemployment spells, but you happen to know that the spells differ systematically and the effectiveness of the program differs systematically by race. Yeah, that can be brought to the public sphere as part of conversation. Policing is obviously on everyone's mind. There is debate, disagreement, and controversy in economics about the role and effectiveness of policing. I wanna hear economists talk about that. That conversation should not be left to one economist or two, but to us acting several. Other examples will come to your mind, but the point is that if we seek to address and affect change, we have to each be involved in all or under all of the hats we hold. Scholar, teacher, colleague, public commentator. If we do those things, and we do them vigorously and in earnest, we can help achieve racial equity, I believe. I may have gone over by a minute. <laughs> I'll turn things over to Lisa. Thank you, Kerwin. Thank you also, Eliana, for that great introduction and to my former professor, Oratio Atanasia, for the inv invitation to present in this session, what can economics do for racial justice? So 
I think like Kerwin, we can do a lot. So we were asked to address these uh, two questions that Eliana posed at the beginning, and I'd like to address each one in turn. The first one with respect to research, and the second one both with respect to research and the profession. So is research currently done in economics helpful to reduce racial inequalities in our society? So I would say, no, our profession has not been as helpful as it could have been with respect to reducing racial inequality, which has its roots in systemic racism in our society. We have spent decades and millions of pages of journals asking two related questions. One, does racial discrimination exist? If so, is it due to statistical discrimination which we interpret as being based on probabilities. And it's considered okay. Actually, it isn't. Or racial animus or intent. We've done a lot to establish that racial discrimination exists. However, we don't answer the question of what to do about it. Many other social science disciplines do, like political science or sociology. The race variable also is doing way too much work in economics. We put a lot of emphasis on the race variable and include it in regression, and we really don't interpret it. We just take it as a, a given and immutable uh, thing. The story of my paper you've probably heard recently, it's a paper on violence and economic growth. The story of it suggests that the economics profession is or has been unwilling to imagine the full range of research questions related to racial inequality. For example, in patenting and innovation. I remember when I undertook this research, I was posed with the question, why would I ever study African-Americans as a reference group in innovation. As if to say, African-Americans don't invent anything, so why even study them? The implication was that we didn't see it in the data or were unaware of it, and therefore it wasn't worth studying. I would think the opposite. If we don't see it, we need to ask why we don't see it. I think that's an equally compelling question. To address the second question that Eliana mentioned, what can we do to approve? And what are some practical suggestions? I have sets of suggestions for both the research and for the profession. I currently serve on the executive committee of the American Economic Association. I was elected to serve last year. And I also serve as the director of the AEA summer program. And I'll say a bit more about that in just a moment. First, we have to acknowledge that systemic racism exists, not just racial disparities. We like to talk about racial disparities, but it's more than racial disparities. What's at the root of those disparities? It is systemic racism. I think in the current environment, We've been challenged to think about these as being structural, these uh, disparities as being structural and not just from one sector to the other. They're everywhere, which suggests that there's some system in place that drives these disparities. We need to acknowledge that systemic racism ex exists both in research and in the profession. If we needed any empirical validation of this claim, the AEA climate study published a year ago provided it. For example, it showed that black women report being discriminated against more than any other group in economics. They take more steps than any other group in economics to avoid racist and sexist behavior, and they disproportionately report being discriminated against with respect to promotion and pay. Second, after we acknowledge that this racism exists, we should take active steps to combat it. Corwin already gave some examples. 
I would pose a series of questions as well. Are we recommending only our friends and classmates for positions at journals? Are we inviting only people we know to be discussants, give papers, chair and organize sessions at conferences, or nominate them for prizes and awards? Are we using examples in our courses and textbooks that are only relevant for white men? Are we standing by and saying nothing when something racist is being said to a colleague or to students in classes when they are the sole member of a minority group? Are we asking the black people in the profession to do disproportionate service and not reward them for it? Are we not hiring, promoting, and tenuring black women because of the narrow conception of fit? All of these things hinder the free flow of ideas and lessen broad participation in economics and make economic research less vibrant and relevant. I would suggest that we take a look at the AEA code of conduct that was posted on the AEA website. And there are lots of resources on the AEA website as well. But at least we should start with the code of conduct as something to guide our actions, especially with respect to what not to do. Third, we should open our imagination and be more curious about economic behavior, regardless of the quarters from which that economic behavior is derived. We need to be fundamentally more curious about our peers. I find lots of research on Black people that include Black people, but aren't informed by the lived experiences of Black people. I believe that my paper on violence and economic activity was not published very readily because referees were likely asking whether anything related to Black people could be generalizable and of general interest. I hear the same kind of question posed about fundamental economic research that is derived from data on Native Americans. We can learn something from everybody. Fourth, other concrete steps are to improve the pipeline. For example, the AEA summer program of which I am currently the director and grassroots activities like the SADI Collective and the Research in Color Foundation. We should enhance mentoring and generally improve the workplace environment. So it's not just the pipeline. This should include reporting and prosecuting racial and gender harassment and misconduct and addressing racial bias. I would echo the words of uh, Kerwin who just finished to say that everyone has to take responsibility and get involved. It's on all of us. Thank you. Over to Imran. Okay, so let me start by saying thank you, Eliana. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be invited to be part of this panel alongside uh, such distinguished speakers. Um, I'm gonna present some very preliminary findings from a research project I've been engaged with, um, with, with a group of uh, stellar young economists. We started this project seven weeks ago when Orazio first invited me to join the panel, um, but despite the results uh, being very preliminary, I hope they're gonna provide some food for thought and discussion, and I'll supplement them with my own sort of personal reflections at the end on what, what economics can do for racial justice. I think minimally what we can do is um, study the role of race and ethnicity in the economy. And I think of breaking this down into, into three components that have been touched upon so far. What the first element is the subject matter. What uh, race related topics do we study and which do we give less attention to? Secondly, what are the implicit incentives that researchers have to conduct race related research? And I'll touch upon that in, in a little while. And third, how do we ensure the selection and retention of minorities into economics, or of course known as the pipeline problem? And obviously, these elements are going to be interlinked. We think that if we have a more diverse set of economists enter and stay in the profession, that will, will partly help to diversify the set of research that's done. What I'm going to cover um, in my slides is just some very preliminary findings related predominantly to the first component on the race-related subject matter of, uh, of economics. So what we do in this study is uh, essentially take the corpus of publications in, in JSTOR, we supplement it with the web of science where, where we need to, 
and we try to document the production of race-related search in economics and other social uh, sciences. So our sample from economics covers over 200 journals, 170,000 publications, and in the most recent waves of data that corresponds to about economic uh, research, generating 4,000 publications per year. The volume of research that economists therefore produce is on a par with political science and is greater than is produced in sociology. So given this sheer volume of output, we're gonna use an algorithmic approach to try to classify race-related research. And we do so using keywords along two dimensions. The first set of keywords we use are based on the minority group or groups being studied. Um, and the second uh, set of keywords we use are based on the topic that's being studied. So in total, we use 48 group-related keywords and 107 topic-related keywords, as well as all of their derivatives to help classify race-related research and economics and these other disciplines. And so we're going to assign a paper to be race-related if there's at least one group keyword and at least one topic keyword in either the title or the, or the abstract of that published piece of research. Now, just to be clear, the topic keyword list that we're focusing on is very much those topics um, that economists have focused on. So we're gonna be really classifying economics oriented research. We're not going to try to capture with our algorithm the types of race related research that other disciplines have done. So in essence, what we're capturing is uh, the extent to which other disciplines have engaged with economics oriented race related research. And so in a sense, that's our like for like comparison that, that we that we want to present here. The, set, the exact set of keywords that we use for analysis are posted on, on, on the web and we would welcome feedback on them on how to refine this um, uh, over time. There's, there's gonna be lots of uh, elements of it that we may well be missing uh, with, with our current set of keywords. So what do we find? There are large differences in the share of race-related research published across uh, three disciplines that we look at, economics, sociology, and political science, with the lowest share consistently being in economics. Less than 1% of published research in economics between 1980 and 1999 was race-related. This has risen over time, but only just. In the last two decades, about 1.4% of all um, economics published articles were, were race-related. Other disciplines have higher shares of race-related research, and despite them having lower volumes of research output, the cumulative total of race-related work produced either in sociology or political science far outnumbers that in economics. On this metric of knowledge produced, economics lags decades behind sociology and political science. And this is all despite our topic keywords to be chosen to be specifically economics orientated. We also see that there was no golden age where economics produced more race-related research than other disciplines. That was simply never the case. We've always produced less despite um, the bias in, in, in the topic keywords that we've used. And finally, on the economics time series, you'll see the dashed lines there just represent some bounds, uh, some reasonable bounds that we might think of as being the true rate of race-related research, taking into account false positives, false negatives that might be induced by, by our algorithm. Under no plausible adjustment can we possibly increase the volume of economic race-related research to, to, to narrow these gaps. If we examine the top tier of economics journals, we might think of as being especially relevant given their, their, the fact that they reflect what's considered to be general interest, they reflect the views of leading scholars, and they're particularly influential on the careers of academics. We see that uh, in, in terms of the cumulative number of race-related articles that have been published, the QJE has, has published more than, than, uh, than the AER and, and, and the JPE. And we'll also see that the share of articles in the top five that are race-related, which, which was originally lower than in the profession as a whole between 1980 and 1999, has now overtaken sort of the, the profession level average. So 2% of articles published in the top five according to our algorithm, are, um, are, are race related. And that fits in line with a number of findings that we have that if you use this metric to try to quantify the incentive researchers have to produce race related research, the, the incentives are there. It's the production in the first place that seems to be somewhat lacking. And so um, when we look at the cumulative number of articles, if we collate together all of the top five journals in economics, 
that still lags behind what is produced by the leading single journals in either sociology or political science. So in order to fix these issues, a first step might be to ask, well, are economists aware of these issues? Do they, do they recognize these patterns of race-related research? So we used the social science prediction platform to elicit predictions for economists in, in, in the run-up to this presentation to try to understand whether economists recognize some of the trends that we've just documented. So in this figure, we're, we're producing the results from, from, uh, from, uh, from, the, from that uh, survey. The black horizontal lines represent our true findings and the box and whisker plot show the distribution of predictions made uh, amongst economists. So on the left-hand panel, we see that economists do accurately predict that we have a, that as a discipline, we have a lower share of race-related research than in either sociology or political science. Um, but we underestimate, uh, sorry, we overestimate the share of race-related research by a factor of about five. About 90% of economists think that there's actually more race-related research that's produced in the discipline than there actually is. And actually, when you look at the right-hand side figure, you see that economists are also overly optimistic about the trends here, that in terms of the predictions, economists think the share of race-related research is rising far faster than it actually is. But at the same time, economists tend to be somewhat pessimistic when they compare the top five to other journals, that the predictions there are that um, the, the, the median economist thinks that the top five are producing less race-related research than all journals, whereas in fact, the, the, the opposite is, uh, is true. Again, reinstating the, the notion that perhaps the incentives to produce work is, is there, is the initial um, production of, of, of the research that's lacking. So where, where do we go from this? So one way to view these numbers is to say that in comparison to sociology and political science, we have something like a 20 or 30 year gap to try to catch up on the metric of cumulative race related research. And one response could be, well, look, that just reflects acceptable differences in subject matter, and we shouldn't be trying to, to close this gap. But if not, then we'd want to ask what economic specific factors can narrow this gap. And this comes down to subject matter, the incentives we might provide, as, as was touched upon by, by Kerwin and, and Lisa, as well as the selection of, of academics in the first place. So let me conclude just by giving some very speculative suggestions on that first element of subject matter from my own reading of the literature uh, and in comparison to, to other disciplines in terms of what we pay attention to and what we don't pay attention to. So whether we like it or not, the issue of race and economics is typically viewed through the lens of discrimination. And economic approaches to discrimination tend to emphasize two, two features, that they focus in on contexts of human in interaction or exchange, and we're very much focusing on what are the motives of discriminators. A lot of economics research is related to trying to provide micro foundations for why individuals appear to discriminate, either by identifying the psychological foundations of animus or taste-based discrimination, or the exact nature of asymmetric information that can lead to statistical discrimination. A lot of new measurement tools that we've taken from other disciplines have been employed to quantify the degree of such discrimination. And many research designs that we've seen being used, both experimental and non-experimental, are fundamentally designed to try to disentangle these two underlying motives for, for discrimination. As a result, that means perhaps less attention is given to other circumstances in which race, ethnicity uh, and, and economics all interact. So let me just conclude by giving three uh, broad examples of the type of work that I think um, we, we might want to um, try to think, you know, why, why is that not being produced? First is the role that perceptions or the anticipation of future discrimination has on ex-ante uh, behavior. So this is to build on long-standing ideas of both self-fulfilling prophecies and more recent integration of ideas in social psychology about um, stereotypes and how they endogenously determine traits across groups. And as a result of, of pushing in that direction, we might better recognize the potential complementarities in between group differences across key stages of the life cycle, whether it's early childhood, formal schooling, gaps that then open up in labor markets or fundamentally in, in the accumulation of wealth and assets. The second element is the study of the cumulative effects of facing microaggressions on behavior. This is, you know, microaggressions is a term sometimes used in other disciplines. Often when minorities say that they're tired, they're referring to having to deal with this constant stream of microaggressions that from, the, from an outside perspective can often seem quite innocuous or, or, or temporary. 
But I imagine each of us on the panel has a story of such a microaggression that has a pretty long lasting impact on our own individual psyches. And it's presumably this kind of link is, is why we think the selection of minorities into economics will bolster the study of, of race in the discipline. But cumulatively, these types of experiences play an important role in determining how we view our own identity. Which group do we want to belong to? How do we think we should behave? What should we aspire to? And it's really this richness of within group variation that is often missing from, from the economic uh, uh, analysis. And as Lisa was mentioning, this makes controlling for a race dummy a somewhat bizarre or meaningless um, uh, uh, approach. And it also asks us to question the notion of race as a static concept within an individual. We think of these things as being very fluid. And I think there's a branch of economics that we can borrow from here. Ulrika Mamendia has some tremendous papers looking at how experiences through life then shape very important decisions individuals make later in life. I think some of those same ideas can be applied um, in, in, to the study of race. And finally, as, as was previously touched on by, by Lisa, there remains the issue of understanding institutional or systemic biases that minorities face that don't stem from interpersonal interactions, but are built into um, systems. So for example, how organizations are structured, whether that's a firm, whether that's the economics discipline as a whole, that can be a, a function of historical legacies, as we've seen in the UK, the use of prediction models in public policy and so on and so forth. So I think in general, there remains a very understated role of macro in race related research. So when we look at the NBER and CPR working papers, macro has the lowest share of race related research according to our algorithm. But I think this is somewhat changing now. A good example is the recent paper by, by Cheng Tae Se and co-authors examining how much of the growth in US labor productivity since 1960 can be attributed just to a more efficient allocation of talent over time in, in, in the US economy. And so by being less focused on the exact causes of discriminatory behavior, but more focused on studying the aggregate implications of these biases, this type of macro orientated literature, I think can nicely complement the body of microeconomic work on race related research to economics and help highlight that the issue is not just one of fairness, but also efficiency, that we all become better off if individuals are allowed to fulfill their potential. Thank you. I'm gonna hand over to Leonard. All right, so thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I really enjoyed being on this panel. Uh, you know, Kerwin, Lisa, Imran has raised very, very important points that overlap with some that I'll be making. Uh, so this paper um, that I titled Racial Justice from Within, Diversity and Economics uh, and Inclusion in Economics is joined with Marlene Kofi, who is uh, a fresh a graduate uh, from University of Montreal, who is junior faculty uh, at University of Toronto. Um, so um, it's clear that economics has uh, made, uh, yeah, economics has made important contribution, theoretical contribution and critical contribution to the research on racial justice. You know, uh, labor market discrimination, racial bias in policing, positive discrimination, historical roots of racial inequalities. And there are, there are a number of seminal papers, but one that I think uh, I find it particularly inspiring is the Bertrand Mulinatan paper that experimentally uh, test or measure, detect and measure discrimination by calling, by looking at how identical CV one white uh, versus black, more likely uh, to be called when you are white, when uh, better CVs are, uh, are called when it's white, and then among black, it doesn't really matter whether it's good or bad, or you know, the, the, the quality of the CV doesn't really matter. So it's very, very inspiring. So um, what I'm going to, uh, to, to suggest what I think are some of the limitation of, this, of the race, the research on race, I think is a lack of regional scope. Um, you know, I think that are in terms of roots and features of racial inequalities, Latin America, the Caribbean and Africa has really, really, really important uh, uh, kind of contribution to make. So I would like to, to, to think that development economics in particular, for instance, has to integrate uh, race inequality in terms of research. I mean, you focus particularly on, on, on Brazil, for instance, 
the history of slavery in Brazil has really, really interesting features that are different from, at least slightly different from, from the US, that might be very, very, very um, insightful. Another issue, for instance, is enforcement of anti-discrimination law when racism is passive and systemic. You know, for instance, uh, how do you enforce anti-discrimination law not based on a specific action which is outrageous, but based on the fact that there is something passive, implicit, but devastating. You know, like for instance, a department that's never recruited a minority faculty, let's say for 40 years. So they, they done everything by the book, by the book, but yet the result is just totally biased against minorities. How do you, how do you detect that? How do you fix it? You know, another thing that I think it's important, that's what I've been touching by other colleagues, is race and power in theories of organization. You know, I think the reason why you have so much exclusion is because of gatekeeping. And sometimes gatekeepers can be minority themselves or can be, um, you know, uh, can be obviously, uh, you know, you know from, from, the, from the out group or, or um, you know, so, so the logic of this, how do you detect it and fix it? I think it's something that will really benefit from thinking about. And, and like uh, Imran had said earlier and others is I think we need really to develop a data science of racial discrimination. I mean, like if you look at the data on admission, data on uh, faculty recruitment, data on anything that has to do with uh, uh, labor markets, with uh, admission and others, you know, it's, it won't be so difficult to detect that when you are minority, you are more easily dismissed. Um, when you are minority, for instance, the, um, you know, the report on your, I mean, your, the report on your work or the, the, the um, you know, like the evaluation of work is much harsher. And, you know, and the readers, for instance, uh, makes less connection with his own, his or her own experience when it's a minority. So we need, those data exist, but unfortunately rarely used by uh, different university committees and, and other organizational committees. And I think this is, uh, uh, this is uh, a problem. So as my other colleagues, as uh, Evelyn, Evelyn and Lisa and uh, in particular have, uh, have stressed, I think uh, it, it, the failure of economics is not much about the research per se. You know, the research is a limitation, but I think the most is the institutional failure. You know, I mean, like the, the data are just stunning, you know, like black represent only 3% of the faculty in US institutions. And uh, if you take the top 60 universities is lower. Uh, graduation rates, so admission and graduation of minorities are just very, very low. There are universities, for instance, uh, may not have, have a minority in their graduate student, uh, you know, cohort, any cohort for four or five years, you know, and it's, it's, it's really, really, really problematic. So, and when you come to Africa, I think things are actually worse. Because obviously, you know, Africans get admitted in PhD program. Some are doing very, very well. And I mean, some says that per currently there might be less admits by Africans in PhD program in the US than there were 40 years ago and, and 50 years ago because there were scholarships, uh, opportunities for African students to come and study in some places, particularly Northwestern Michigan and so on. Uh, you know, less of a case today. But in terms of research, this is what's really, really bad, you know, because for instance, take impact evaluation studies, you know, a, a, a study done by Dial in France in, 19, in 2011 showed that only 11% of impact evaluation study by the World Bank have Africa quarters. And if you look at, uh, I mean, impact evaluation is not something hugely sophisticated, you know, so, and the, 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 buying and the implication of local and in this research is essential, you know, because from the beginning, when you want to design it from, and also to the application, when you want to get the work out. And yet 
basically only 11%. And I, you know, the study was done in 2011, but I don't think much has changed since then. In terms of publication, you know, uh, somebody showed that only 7% of publication in African development have African quotas. And my colleagues early on, all the colleagues early on have told me how this matter, it matters because of voice, because of empowerment, and also because uh, insight, you know, I mean, like people who have experienced uh, racism are more equipped to understand the nuances and to be able to, uh, to make suggestions that are important. So to show the racial bias in clubs, you know, I mean, not in negative, uh, not negative connotation, uh, as, uh, as Karen has suggested, I, I started, we, we started, you know, with um, Marlene, a compilation of CVs and achievements of all the NBR members in uh, development economics and political economy. So we have uh, 177 economists affiliated to those two groups. And then we have a comparable group of, of Africans who are actually teaching in US universities. I'm not talking about people that are not known and people who are not active, you know, I mean, so, and, and the, uh, you know, the research is ongoing, but I'm going to present some descriptive statistics. So first of all, what is, we find is that um, only 2% of, uh, uh, you know, are of members of uh, NBR development, for instance, and uh, are African, and over 90% are white or from South Asia. So there is a huge concentration. So for instance, 70% of the members got their PhD from Harvard, MIT, Berkeley, Harvard, Princeton, or Yale, Princeton, and LSE. So uh, it, the, by the fact that you come from those schools, you are in, you know? And what is interesting is that, you know, it's how early the decisions are made to get those people in, you know? Up to one year, I mean, even before you graduate, you know, 20% are in. After two years, 35. After three years, 50, 85. So I would think that it would take four years for nobody to prove that he belongs really. No, 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 no. If you are instead from certain category, you are already in, you know, 85% uh, of, of, of time, you know? So, and so what is interesting is, is also that, uh, uh, you know, okay. So, yeah, okay, yeah. And so one second, I have, uh, Okay, sorry. Okay, so I have I have uh, two more minutes. So okay, I, I just what I did was I take this. So take for instance publication. You take the African and the NBR member. So they are very similar. You know, uh, one uh, one year after PhD before membership, the typical NBR member in development has one. The typical African has one. And uh, if you take for instance the top five. Uh, they, they don't, none of them have top five, but what is interesting is that the vast majority, do, so there are pretty in, uh, similar initial uh, de de uh, distribution, the median are very, very comparable in terms of productivity. So, and uh, so there are some very interesting uh, cases, for instance, uh, you know, like 60% of the current members recruiting up to two years after the PhD present a median African profile, you know, which is basically 60% of the current member has, of current MBR look like the median African, and yet the African are not in, and the rest are, are, are in. So, and there are some interesting cases. There is one African, for instance, who is in the 95 percentile in terms of top five publication, he's not in. Um, there is another one who, has two top five publications after four years. He's in 90 percentile, he's not in. Uh, so, and, uh, and the list goes on. So I think uh, to, I, maybe I'll take one minute to, to, to wrap up. So we need really um, to question the way uh, some of those organizations um, basically work to give a fair chance to minority uh, to get in, not based on the fact that they're minority, based on the work they have done. I mean, not like we are driving them along. No, they have accomplished something. 
So, and, and we, we, we so, so that's very important. So the, the fact that some people are in more or less systematically because of where they get their PhD from, it's a problem. Uh, anyway, so uh, let me finish by, by mentioning that at the roots of this is also the issue of pipeline that Lisa has mentioned. And uh, besides, and, and I believe that the pipeline issue uh, is something that we have to provide, not just demanding. And I think the work that uh, Lisa and, and Karen has been doing, uh, you know, it's fantastic. And, I, I, you know, I, I set up the African Council of Economics to bring Africans in, the, in PhD. We also set up, uh, you know, uh, um, a pipeline program with Hunter College in Harlem, at the heart of Harlem, uh, to, 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 to expand these opportunities, not only to Black um, Americans, um, Afri African American, but also African from the diaspora, coming from Latin America and uh, Caribbeans and Europe in general. So I, I, I think we got to do something. And uh, we also need to question the, some of the way the, our organization work. This has to be based on data. This has to be based on research so that we can correct so, some of those uh, dysfunctions in the way our profession work. Thank you very much. So thank you, Leonard, uh, uh, Imran, Lisa, and Carwin for really thought-provoking uh, contributions. And um, I think we, we can, you know, start our discussion. We have so many inputs uh, to choose from. So let me uh, kick it off with uh, some thoughts of my own that I had while you were talking. And then there was a, a question from the audience that I'm also going to ask. So on, on my side, one view um, is that uh, uh, what you have highlighted comes from deliberate choices of excluding certain people or penalizing certain topics. Another view is uh, that uh, they come also from a lack of understanding, uh, low awareness about constraints that are faced if you come from a certain background. So uh, one question in my mind is, how can we make these experiences shared if you're not uh, an African American. Uh, how can you understand what it means in the profession without sounding confrontational? So, what could be steps to be taken there? On the research side, um, I, I found what Imran highlighted really, you know, uh, very strong. And uh, my view is that part of why race is so underrepresented in the topics of our research is that economists have long had. Uh, uneasiness with what they perceive as being soft concepts. So if we cannot define something rigorously or measure it well, we leave it out. But it doesn't mean it's unimportant. So um, could it be that we really need to engage more with other disciplines? Political scientists have studied race forever. It's not a, you know, a black box. There's uh, something about endogeneity and identity uh, and concerns that has been quite well researched. Could it be that by engaging more with psychologists, with sociologists, with political scientists, uh, mm -hmm. we are better able to embed these things in a rigorous framework as economists? And to this, I want to link with what uh, uh, Kerwin was saying about the barriers and uh, the the courses we have in our first year sequence. So even if you don't want to be a macroeconomist, you're asked to study macro and to do it well. So could it be that uh, even if you don't want to work on race or gender or other uh, issues like this, part of our training requires to understand these concepts about society uh, by investing not just in field courses, but in, in the curriculum that economists are trained on into um, you know, a better understanding of these concepts. So is this something that's completely you know, out of the realm of feasibility? Would it help uh, make higher quality research? Okay. So let me stop, stop here on my side and just uh, uh, read out one question. And then I'd like whoever uh, among you wants to uh, address any of the points that come up to start talking and um, interact. So the question from the audience that uh, was asked while Kerwin was speaking was about uh, uh, public versus private universities and whether higher engagement and recognition of public universities would be a step 
towards creating inclusiveness, because uh, if uh, private universities are unaffordable, then you really have an expectation of fair involvement. So uh, why don't we now, why don't I now leave the floor to panelists and, uh, you know, uh, feel free to address any of these or your own thoughts, uh, bring them in. Can I just jump in, Eliana? Yes, sure. So, um, so I, I think you bring up an interesting point about studying other fields, bringing in other fields. The story of my paper related to violence and economic activity was that I had to educate our colleagues in macro on US history. And it wasn't in an open way, it was in a combative way from the referees. You know, what, you know, they were asking questions like, what is a former slave, right? You know, something that I, I thought would have been part of an education for anyone in the world. I, I, I think slavery was so, touched so many different parts of the world that um, to be unfamiliar with it to me was, uh, was odd. But also the concept of human rights and civil rights and lynching, for example, the, my using extra judicial killing and extra legal killing interchangeably with lynchings set off some people who were referees and it did so systematically. I got that question fairly often. And that to me suggested that these had been reserved, those terms had been reserved for people who were not black. They were used for uh, people who were involved in human rights, which were identified implicitly with those who were white or in Central or Latin America or something else. But I'm saying that we've, we've got to have uh, much more curiosity about the world, no matter how it comes, whether it is through other disciplines, but we have to bring a lot more to, to bear. And we have that, we, we have that. Lots of other uh, sub-disciplines study other fields and bring them to bear. If I may make a comment here, just, just thanks for Lisa's comment. M much of our conversation, indeed all of it, has been about ways in which our profession, our discipline, might be expanded, rendered more uh, sensitive, and uh, have more elastic boundaries as to, and permeable boundaries, as to encompass new ways of framing a question and borrowing of insights from other fields. So that's been made by, that point has been made by all four of us and by Ileana and probably by members of the audience too. Before we close though, I wanna lean ever so slightly in the other direction, ever so slightly, um, and acknowledge straightforwardly what is true about our field of economics. Yeah? So without anyone having bad intent, I believe, Economists did not, before Becker's dissertation, write papers in economics about discrimination to a first approximation. Becker's theory of discrimination gave us all a way of capturing a phenomenon, the existence of which we all knew whereby we all, I mean, economists of the 30s, 40s, and 50s certainly knew about this, but didn't have the language to nail, to test, etc. Becker's framing, whatever one feels about his characterization of animus, equilibrium sorting, marginal discriminator, and the like, gave us the lens and the tools in economics to attack a thing whose existence I think we never doubted. Arrow. Uh, and others writing about statistical discrimination serve much the same function. What I wanna say is that I believe that this thing, let's say, for example, uh, how we integrate conversations about microaggressions. As a dark-skinned black man, believe me, there's all kinds of microaggressions I experienced, say, within the last month. I, so it's not, I'm not in any way doubting the existence of the thing or its adverse impact on somebody. But how are we as economists, given the tools we use, the standards of evidence we've agreed upon, the way we engage in syllogistic reasoning, what it, that, how are we to take that to either th theory that's convincing or empirical work that gets our field to come along? 
part of me, as I look at where we are, I feel frustration, not because the field is willfully holding a hand up, but because the field is searching for, hoping for, some innovation on the theoretical or empirical side that enables us to using our tools, using our tools, attack questions or issues that we know to be important and that matter. Identity, for example, is something that sociologists have written about for 100 years or more, yet it wasn't engaged in seriously by economists until recently, yeah? And so we see economists formalizing the idea of identity and formalizing it in a way that is accessible and amenable to analysis by people on this call, yeah? Um, we need that too. And I cannot, I don't want us to close without emphasizing that all of us can be engaged in that enterprise. We need to do stuff to clarify, to formalize, and to make useful to economists in the world, the idea of systemic racism, the existence of which I think all of us believe. But how is one to study that as a public, uh, you know, a guy doing public finance, as someone doing uh, macro? There needs to be formalization, there needs, to, and we cannot say that whereas in other fields, that formalization is demanded, but it isn't when we study race. Yeah, No one is saying that exactly, but I, I, I hope, um, I, I want to make this point about uh, an obligation that falls on us all on the research side. Right. Right. And I agree with Kerwin. And my paper is that story. And I encourage everybody to read the paper and see the Planet Money podcast about it because it was standard macro that I was using. I was using standard macro. I was talking about race and I was met with a lot of resistance. But I'm hopeful about the future and I'm hopeful that we will study identity as we study gender, that we will also study race. Because yes. I think that we have identified, we found ways, algorithms to, uh, to specifically identify gender and, and study gender. And I think we can do the same with race. So I think we are running out of time and uh, you know there are some really interesting questions in the chat. Uh, I'm not sure we can uh, have enough time to address them. So maybe let me rather ask uh, Leonard and Imran if they wanted to add something to conclude. Oh, so I think that um, uh, I think at the core of the issue is, you know, a profession look like a society, you know, so we need to look inside us and change rules to make the profession more inclusive. Uh, second thing is, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, multidisciplinarity is happening already. So expand it to um, the study of race. Geographic scope is something which is rapidly uh, increasing, so we should also do the same thing on race. And at the end of the day, it's about practical step as well to make sure that uh, young African, African-Americans are welcome in the profession. So admission committees, recruitment committees have to keep that in mind and they have to be held accountable if they don't. Thank you. So I, I'd just like to say that I think one of the hardest questions I've been grappling with is whether there's something inherent in the, in the methodology of economics that prevents us studying these issues. And I think the answer to that is a profound, no, it's not, the, it's not our methodology that's holding us back. We are imperialists and we've kind of moved into other disciplines. We borrowed from them. And as Josh Angra's paper shows, we're, we're very influential in being cited in other disciplines. So it's very important what economists do because it has these spillover effects across other social sciences. But it, it's not that we don't take into account what those um, what those other disciplines say, incorporate them, but we do have a requirement of formalism. We do have some notions of what we regard as being credible evidence. But I think if you look at what's published today, maybe 20 years ago, you would have said that was impossible to have any evidence on that. And the, the discipline moves on in many different dimensions. I think this will just be one other dimension. Where I think there might be an issue is the formalism then leads us to say the null is always one of uh, no discrimination because that's mm -hmm. something that we can formalize. It gives us point predictions and, and we like that. But over and above that, I think there may be an important interaction between the way the discipline is organized in terms of the hierarchical structures we have, as been mentioned by, by everybody, 
And that in itself leading to an inherent conservatism in what people think or are willing to endorse. And that as an editor is something that um, is very, very hard to understand how to, how to offset that. But I think it's been well documented that the hierarchical structures in our discipline are somewhat different than in other social sciences. Um, and without changing that, we may not be able to, without all of the other advances, actually get this type of research to be um, supported or people to take a risk on that. We are inherently risk averse and perhaps that's related to, to the way the discipline is organized. So thank you so much. I, I really hope that all of you who've been attending this panel have uh, you know, learned something and I would like to encourage you to reach out to the speakers because I'm sure you have a lot of questions from them but also experiences and suggestions that you may make. And collectively um, as professional economists but uh, in our different roles, uh, um, I think we are all committed to to do something and to change uh, how things have been going on up until now. So I want to thank the four speakers again for their time and energy. And um, I, I hope there can be another panel at the next World Congress in five years where the statistics are being completely overturned. And uh, <laughs> let's leave it there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.